you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'm uh, delighted to be in Malaysia in the aftermath of the election which has led to the formation of a new government under the helm of uh, Tun Mahathir uh, as Prime Minister. And uh, I think that from the standpoint of analysis, there is a legacy which emanates from the 2005 initiative to criminalize war, uh, which was led by Tun Mahathir and involved uh, many prominent people, both in Malaysia and abroad. Um, I won't dwell upon that, but I think it's, it's a, a very important concept, the criminalization of war, because at this moment, the protagonists of war, of, of war are saying, no, we're not involved in war, we're involved in peacemaking undertakings. My sincere thanks to the CEO of uh, IAIS, uh, Mohammed Hashim Kamali, and to my lifelong friend, Dr. Chandra Musafa, um, and the staff of uh, both JUST and IA IAIS um, for the opportunity to address this audience this afternoon. I'm sorry, this morning. Okay. I we are very much at the crossroads of the most serious crisis, at least in modern history. The United States and its allies, its NATO allies, have embarked upon a military adventure, a long war, which threatens the future of humanity. And that is not an understatement. I should mention that the text the background text of my presentation, if you have a handheld, you can get it online at globalresearch.ca in the left-hand corner. It's a, uh, so uh, thanks to technology. I won't necessarily be following uh, this text verbatim, uh, but it's, uh, it's a background text of analysis which, which may be useful at some subsequent stage. Uh, and when I, I say that this is the most uh, serious crisis in modern history, in, in fact, in world history, which threatens the future of humanity, that is because ultimately war is also sustained by a propaganda apparatus which presents war as a humanitarian endeavor either under the concept of responsibility to protect or under the, the guise of the so-called global war on terrorism. So if you, ask, if you ask President Trump and say you're waging war on, on Syria, he said, no, we are involved in a counter-terrorism operation. We are there as peacemakers. Of course, Wars of aggression, as defined by the 2005 initiative to criminalize war, but also the Nuremberg Protocol, is a criminal undertaking. And in this particular instance, most of, our, of the Western heads of state and heads of government would be identified as war criminals. Certainly, 
the President of the United States and his entire team are war criminals. Why? Because they're waging war on sovereign countries. Now, they may say, well, we're not waging war on Yemen. It's Saudi Arabia and the Emirates. But I think we're not stupid to that extent because U.S. military advisors are swarming Saudi Arabia and, and the Emirates, and much of the bombing campaigns are coordinated with, uh, with U.S. military personnel, either in the respective countries or in Yemen. They're, they're there, and they've been there for the last 10 years. Okay? Uh, the United States has the tendency to uh, delegate its war endeavors either to proxy countries such as Saudi Arabia and Qatar, uh, sorry, not Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Emirates, uh, which incidentally also involved in the financing and training of terrorists, namely Al Qaeda affiliated uh, uh, organizations which are active. In, uh, in Syria, and these so-called rebels are in fact mercenaries. And they, are, they belong to Al-Qaeda, and of course Al-Qaeda in Arabic means the database. Why is it called the database? Because back in 1979, the CIA established a database of mercenaries when they were brought, the Mujahideen were brought to Afghanistan to, to destabilize a secular uh, government as well as to uh, confront, of course, uh, the Soviet Union, which at the time had been invited into in a government relationship between the two governments. It was invited into Afghanistan uh, with a view to confronting the terrorists. Now, that was called the Soviet-Afghan War, but it was really a war which involved directly the United States of America because the United States of America was, was supporting, financing the Mujahideen and the Mujahideen were Al-Qaeda. Osama bin Laden was recruited by the CIA when he was 22 years old. All this is documented so that when they identify Osama bin Laden as an enemy of the United States, he was created by the United States. And when Rumsfeld in, 19, in 2001 said, we can't find him, we don't know where he is, that is absolute nonsense. I'll, uh, Osama bin Laden's whereabouts were known. And uh, I, I just, you should just reflect on the fact that we have modern technology, which is called a GPS, uh, which is very often inserted in the bodies of individuals that you are, who are under the auspices of, of a particular uh, uh, military power. So that, um, well, let me digress because on the 10th of September 2001, Osama bin Laden was in a Pakistani military hospital in Rawalpindi. Everybody knew where he was, and that was confirmed by CBS News' Dan Rather. But he was admitted on the 10th, one day before the tax, and then Rumsfeld said, we don't know where he is. It's like looking for a needle in a stack of hay, I quote, unquote. Now let me return to the broader issues. This military agenda, it's a long war. The term the long war is not, is not a term of the critics, it's a Pentagon concept. When they say we are involved in a long war, they mean it. They've defined it, they've defined a road map. And this, at, at the same time, this war is intricately related to an economic agenda. I, I started my, well, I started my career as an economist, I'm still an economist, 
But then I started to realize that all these wars were in fact economic undertakings. They're there to support, uh, to support economic interests. And uh, war is good for business. War is good for business because it sustains the military industrial complex, the massive allocations to, to uh, defense spending. But it also seeks to support the expansion of certain uh, global interests such as the oil industry. And uh, uh, that, I think, is very important. Uh, and the, the wave of Islamophobia is also directed against it. It supports both a military agenda as well as an economic agenda. And I, I mention this because it's very important. Up to 70% of the global uh, reserves of crude oil are located in Muslim lands, in Muslim countries. And if those lands were occupied by Buddhists, they would be waging a, a campaign against Buddhists. And it just so happens that the oil is in Muslim countries and the United States of America has less than 2% of global oil reserves and the various countries from, let's say, the tip of Saudi Arabia up to the Caspian Sea Basin, plus Malaysia, Indonesia, Nigeria, Algeria, Egypt, Libya. These countries have above 60% of the global oil, crude oil reserves. I'm not talking about non-conventional or gas reserves, but in other words, there is a battle for oil. There's definitely a battle for oil. And how do you wage a battle for oil? You, uh, you uh, desecrate the concepts of the people who inhabit those countries. And you uh, wage a campaign against Islam, which is called Islamophobia. So there are various facets. And then you say, well, you intimate that Muslims are terrorists. And the only reason you're doing that is that you want to take control of those oil reserves. And I, I should mention several years back, uh, I gave a, a lecture on uh, the broader issues of the Middle East. And I mentioned that in 1995, U.S. Central Command headquarters, uh, U.S. Central Command, which is one of the regional commands, is mainly Middle, Middle East, produced a document in 1995, so we're talking about more, more than 20 years ago, and they said very specifically, first Iraq, then Iran. That was the roadmap. That was already stated back in 1995. And then they said, so that we may ensure uh, effective access to strategic oil reserves. Okay? That was their statement. It was a military statement. It was not a political uh, or economic statement, although it ha has economic implications. And one person in the, in the audience said, asked me, um, Professor, that was in Canada, he said, he said, Professor, but we need that oil. Speaking on behalf of the Western countries or the or United States, which has less than 2%. What's the solution? And I said, the solution is international trade. Buy it, don't steal it. But the whole process of military expansion is the control over resources and, the tr and ultimately the objective is to transform countries into territories, undermine their institutions, erase their history, destroy their culture, um, send in Monsanto with genetically modified seeds which destroys their agriculture, uh, the many different facets of this global uh, military agenda and ultimately we are dealing with 
an imperial project which is one of conquest, of economic conquest. And it, it's by no accident, of course, I'll mention Afghanistan. Afghanistan supplies over 90% of the world's supply of heroin, uh, thanks to the U.S. invasion. Uh, because uh, just prior to that U.S. invasion, the Afghan government, the Taliban Afghan government, with all due respect, they implemented the most successful drug eradication program in the history of the United Nations, and they reduced the, the, the production of opium to and, less than 200 tons. And the moment the invasion took place, the levels of opium production regained their historical levels, and now, today, uh, they are something of the order of 30 times what they were in 2001. Uh, literally uh, uh, creating a, a flood of opi opioids into Western countries and worldwide, which is creating a crisis, a social crisis. But let's face it, it's a multi-billion dollar operation. It's a multi-billion dollar operation which accrues to all the intermediaries in the global drug trade. So that, I'm not saying that that was the objective of the Afghan war, but it was certainly a, a consideration. And, it, and in the, its aftermath, why is it that the eradication program did not sustain itself? Why? Because opium is, is a very lucrative uh, international uh, commodity. Uh, which, uh, uh, which benefits not only the organized crime, but the financial institutions, the retailers, the wholesalers, and so on. And in addition to that, uh, Afghanistan has lithium, and without lithium, we don't have our cell phones, okay? Because lithium is what you make batteries out of. It's also a strategic metal, and various other strategic metals, plus oil and oil and gas reserves, so that um, these military deployments uh, are very much related to, to economic objectives. And neoliberalism, uh, the thrust of macroeconomic reforms, interfaces with the military agenda. Uh, it, it's not by accident that, uh, let's say, the president of the world bank uh, was previously with the U.S. Department of Defense. We've, we've had various examples. Brzezinski uh, at one, uh, no, I'm sorry, not, uh, not Brzezinski, but we've had, um, it was Wolfowitz, but we had McNamara, who was Secretary of Defense, who then went over to the World Bank. Uh, so that there's a go-between the, the various institutions which are in charge of the U.S. military and those which are in charge of the global economy and which impose reforms on, on countries around the world. And I should mention that there's also a link uh, regarding the various uh, regime changes which are implemented worldwide, which uh, involve the routine uh, intervention in elections in different countries, the, the appointment of, uh, of uh, governments which are friendly to the United States, uh, including all the countries which have been the victims of U.S.-led wars. Vietnam, Cambodia, well, Indonesia, in, in one form or another, uh, where these, the, the, the process is to install uh, US, well, U.S. supported governments uh, rather than independent uh, governments which uh, respond to the interests of their population and uh, 
and act in the interests of their country. I wanted to say something about the title of this venue, which, uh, which says the globalization of war, US-NATO threat directed against Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea. Now, the threat is not directed solely against those countries, but uh, those are non-compliant countries. They're countries which, in one form or another, they're very different, have refused to abide by the demands of Washington. And ironically, from the U.S. standpoint, these four countries are, are very much at the core of what we call U.S. foreign policy and U.S. military strategy. Uh, back in 2007, the simulation of a Third World War by the Pentagon was released uh, and it was made public. They do these simulations every year, but and they usually use fictitious countries, okay? But it just so happens that in 2007, when there were documents which were released by the Washington Post, uh, I won't go into details, but uh, these were simulations of a war between the United States of America on the one hand and four and four fictitious countries which were Shuria, Rubek, Birmingham, and Nebazi. Shuria, China, Russia, Rubek, Birmingham, Iran, Nemazi, North Korea. Every, well, it was well understood and the analysis in the media was clear that these were the four non-compliant countries. And they are at the center of U.S. foreign policy because ultimately once they, they are, the other countries have been subjected to, uh, to U.S. Uh, demands uh, for the most part and do not constitute a threat to U.S. hegemony. But th these four countries are at the center of U.S. Po foreign policy and that is the reason why uh, uh, they, they appear in, in, in that way. Um, yet, I should mention that the, the, the process of, of um, the military agenda is far more complex, um, and it involves, a global, it involves a global military agenda, which is uh, coupled with an economic agenda, uh, and very often it's the economic agenda, it's what we might describe as economic warfare which subjects these countries to, to the demands of, of, uh, of the United States of America. And uh, uh, these, uh, uh, these, this economic warfare can take on different forms. I'd like to mention one particular instance which is very important which affected Malaysia in the 1990s, the Asian crisis. The Asian crisis was economic warfare. It was economic warfare. Why? Because anybody who's familiar with, with uh, speculative markets knows that naked short selling against the currency uh, uh, will lead to the collapse of the exchange rate. And that is precisely what they did. Powerful. Western financial institutions, together with Japan, waged an attack on the currencies of several Asian countries, in including Thailand, the Republic of Korea, Indonesia, and also Malaysia. Now, I mention this because that's part of the history of Malaysia. And Malaysia 
Well, let me say, Malaysia took certain precautions in regulating its currency, in implementing currency controls, which the other three countries were not able to adopt. There were controls on the ringgit, there were control, there were, and, and there was, there was a counter speculative operation, which was led under the helm of Tun Mahathir. Now, what happened in, let me just mention the case of South Korea. South Korea had exactly the same project in mind as Tun Mahathir. In fact, it's a larger country, heavily industrialized, uh, they understand international finance, and the governor of the central bank and the minister of finance uh, said, we will introduce our own project to protect our financial system and our currency. What happened? The U.S. Embassy in Seoul ordered that these two individuals be fired. They were fired on orders of Washington. And of course, the United States had at the time 33,000 troops stationed in South Korea, um, and uh, they instructed uh, the president of South Korea at the time to fire these two individuals and to, to, to appoint a new team, a new minister of finance who happened to be a former official of the World Bank. That's how it happened. What happened to the one? It crashed. And it led to the most destructive uh, bailout in, uh, in South Korean history. It was not due to any failures in the economy of South Korea. It was actually, it was, uh, it was economic warfare, and it led to the takeover of, of large sectors of, of the, both the financial apparatus as well as industry by U.S. Um, companies. And, uh, and often, I should mention, at a negative price. I won't get into the details. What did Mahathir do? There were no troops here. There was no, there, there were, well, there was certainly conflict within the government. I won't get, get uh, uh, discuss that. But Malaysia was able to withstand the Asian crisis through a counter plan, uh, which was adopted by a sovereign government and which succeeded in sustaining the viability of the Malaysian economy and the ringgit. And that, uh, of course, is absolutely fundamental because those instruments of economic warfare are still there and they've become even more sophisticated in recent years. You can now manipulate the price of basic food staples, push them up and then push them down, or you do the same thing with oil. So there's a whole movement of speculative operations which belong to that realm of economic warfare. And economic warfare will interface with the instruments of conventional or even non-conventional warfare. Now, back in the, in the early uh, 21st century, uh, prior to the accession of George W. Bush to the White House, uh, the, what we call the neoconservatives, which were largely the partners of the Bush administration, they put together a document which uh, was called the Project for the New American Century. And now what is distinct about this project is that it really defines the long war. It defines and acknowledges the long war. Of course, if you ask, uh, if you ask Secretary of State Pompeo, are you waging a long war? He'll say, no, we're, we're involved in peacemaking. We're sending in our troops to make sure that the local population are not, 
are not killed by their government. That's what's happening in, in Syria. They accuse Bashar al-Assad of killing their own people, which is an absolute fabrication, and the media sustains those fabrications. Okay? But so they will say, no, we're involved in peacekeeping. We, we, we're coming, we're killing about two million, three million people in Iraq, but it's all right because it's, it's a peacemaking undertaking. Okay? And the media will concur, and they will, they, will, uh, they will concur with a lot of ambiguity. They say, yes, there were people killed, but it's collateral damage. Okay? But now the project of, for the new American century is very explicit. It's very explicit. It, 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 uh, it identifies very clearly what they want to do, and I'll summarize it. The PNA, well, the, it, it is, in a sense, a blueprint for global domination. And it declares the following objectives. Defend the American homeland. Well, the American homeland has never been attacked uh, for more than two or three hundred years, as far as I know. Uh, where I'm a Canadian, we border with Canada, with the United States. They've tried to invade us several times. They even had uh, a, a plan, in, in not long time ago, in the 1920s, to invade Canada. It, it's official military plan to invade Canada. And somehow the Canadians forgot all about it. But uh, defend the American homeland, well, that's an ideological statement. Because then they'll say, oh, North Korea wants to attack us. Um, now, this is the most important com concept. Fight and decisively win multiple simultaneous major theater wars. What this means is that they are not in the consecutive mode of warfare, where you go in, you, well, at least in terms of what's on this paper, on, on this document. It's simultaneously. Uh, and the third objective is to perform the constabulary duties associated with shaping the security environment in critical regions. Now, the constabulary functions could be the sending of special forces, it could be its non-theater operations, it could be uh, what they might call a bloody nose operation. It's not sending in troops necessarily. It might be, it might be a regime change uh, supported by the National Endowment for Democracy where they destabilize the government, or it may be actually the whole gamut of, of, uh, of economic warfare. And the fourth, which is very important, transform U.S. forces to exploit the revolution in military affairs. That concept, as defined in, in the PNAC, is simply to build, uh, in the wake of the Cold War, and in the wake of the Cold War, they actually acknowledged that the East-West conflict was no longer there and that they didn't need to have a whole bunch of weapons. But this actually means that you have to modernize your, your, uh, your arsenal. Uh, of course, it's Star Wars, which was defined during the Reagan administration, but it goes much beyond that. Uh, it also consists in developing a new generation of nuclear weapons. Um, and uh, it involves massive expenditures in, in the so-called defense industry. And um, much of this weaponry actually is dysfunctional, including the nuclear weapons. Uh, the Trump administration now has a $1.2 trillion, $1.2 trillion nuclear weapons program. It has enough weapons already to blow up the planet several times. Okay? I'm not, that's not an understatement. Uh, but it also is now uh, 
pushing for the development of what they call the more usable uh, low yield nuclear weapons. And that is not something which emerged during the Trump administration. It, some analysts are saying it did. Those more usable uh, low yield uh, nuclear weapons emerged, well, they've, they've existed since the 1990s. They're exactly the same as conventional, as the, as the strategic nuclear weapons, but the delivery system is different and they've existed, they've been functional since 1995. Uh, they are the so-called tactical nuclear weapons. Some, some analysts, well, most analysts call them the mini-nukes because they're of their low explosive capacity. But when you start to, to dig the military literature, you realize that a mini-nuke today, a small nuclear bomb, has an explosive capacity between one-third and 12 times a Hiroshima bomb. And let us recall that in the first seven seconds in Hiroshima, uh, 100,000 people were killed uh, due to the explosion and, of course, subsequent radiation. Uh, now, uh, in line with, uh, with, with what I mentioned earlier, the, the United States will say, or the Pentagon will say, well, we're not really involved in, in war, we're involved in peacemaking undertakings, and uh, we're there to, uh, to protect countries, and we're there to, uh, to uh, wage a, a war on terrorism around the world. Just so happens that terrorists are also supported by us, but never mind. And now, um, then with regard to nuclear war, they will say, but they've hired scientists for that, and I'll mention it's very crucial, uh, they will say that the tactical nuclear weapon, the more usable low yield nuclear weapon, is, quote, safe for the surrounding civilian population because the explosion is underground. These are bunker buster bombs with nuclear warheads, but underground means about 30 feet underground. It, is, it will still have a mushroom crowd, a cloud and kill tens of thousands of people in the first uh, few minutes after explosion. And uh, what, I'm, uh, what I'm suggesting to you is that not only are we misled on the potential consequences of a nuclear bomb or nuclear explosion, we are, we the broader public, but the decision makers themselves tend to believe their own propaganda because the concept uh, of low yield, more usable, those are the terms that the Pentagon uses, more usable means we might use them without the collateral damage, including of killing civilians. Of course, it's a nonsensical statement. But if you look at the discourse, the political discourse, they say, yes, we can use them. They're more usable. They're low yield. And why would we have a $1.2 trillion uh, nuclear weapons program if it weren't to develop these uh, these um, these bombs as peacemaking, uh, uh, you know, as peacemaking instruments. Now, what they have really done is that they've relabeled, they've relabeled the bombs. It's a bit like uh, the people who smoke in this room. They know that when they take their pack of cigarettes, they look and see smoking could cause cancer. Okay, and and uh, if you have a label on a nuclear bomb. During the Cold War, it would say, weapon of mass destruction, this can cause a nuclear holocaust. It's, the label is there. And that was called mutually assured destruction. It relates to a bygone era, but they've scrapped that concept completely. And now they're saying, we, we, will, we have a preemptive uh, nuclear doctrine, 
which means that we might even attack countries, non-nuclear states, on a preemptive basis so that they don't attack us. Okay? And that's a very, of course, that's a very dangerous concept. They've defined it in, in terms of conventional warfare, but also, uh, also in terms of nuclear warfare. So we will take that country out before they take us out. The fact of the matter is we have never been taken out in the last 200 years, okay? But never mind. People read that, and people in the military hierarchy will read the military manuals, and they will re read the specifics of the B-6112 bomb, which is this expensive military gadget which is being developed at, at, at cost to U.S. taxpayers. Needless to say, that all this has devastating impacts on the civilian economy of the United States of America and Western countries, where large portion of uh, large portion of revenue and tax revenues, not to mention debt, is channeled to uh, producing and developing uh, peacemaking weapons of mass destruction. Okay, put it bluntly. Uh, now. We have to, of course, we have to be, uh, we have to be, uh, in, let's say in the anti-war movement, we have to be very clear in questioning the, you know, in questioning the, the concepts, the underlying concepts behind this military doctrine. Uh, when I uh, mentioned earlier and I'll, I'll, I'll focus that on in, in more detail when I mentioned earlier that the PNAC, which essentially defines the, doc, the military doctrine of, of the last two, well, the present administration and the two previous administrations, uh, saying we will fight and decisively win multiple major theater wars, what this signifies is that deployments are taking place in all major regions of the world simultaneously, not consecutively. There's, there are deployments on Russia's western frontier, namely Eastern Europe, the Baltics, uh, the Black Sea region, the Caucasus. That is where the deployment is taking place at Russia's doorstep. And it is largely relying on the on the, for, the on NATO forces, which are extending um, and which are threatening the Russian Federation, and this, of course, is coupled with uh, the whole gamut of Russia Gate uh, uh, smears directed against the Russian pre president. Not to mention the Skripal affair, uh, the the accusations directed against Russia of having meddle, meddled in. In, uh, in the election process in the United States. Uh, it's still ongoing. And in fact, I, recent developments suggest, in fact, that the US public is behind that consensus. They, they consider that Russia is a threat to their security. Uh, and uh, I, I don't see any Russian planes in the streets, in the, you know, in the, in the, in the you know, in, in the skies of New York. Um, and uh, they are also creating uh, this, uh, uh, these, the legends or the, or the, well, the feeling among the broader European public that Russia could invade Western Europe, which is a nonsensical statement. Uh, and uh, th there's absolutely nothing which indicates this. But there's a lot which indicates that there are war preparations directed against the Russian Federation, which are, which are, uh, which, uh, are marked by this militarization of West, Russia's western frontier. Uh, but other regions of the world are also militarized. Uh, the United States is threatening China. Uh, the United States is... Um, is also, well, is threatening China, is threatening Iran, is threatening North Korea. Now, North Korea uh, is not uh, being threatened in the same way as the other uh, two or three countries, but North Korea is a buffer state. 
and all threats directed against North Korea in effect are also directed against Russia and China which have borders with North Korea and uh, it, it, it is also uh, in the design of the United States to prevent these countries from exerting uh, influence within the Korean Peninsula and to oppose the reunification of the two Koreas. If the two Koreas reunite, even in, even in some transitional form, then what you have is the integration of a country of 80 million people, Korea, uh, into the long distance trade, Belt and Road of China, Trans-Siberian trade, uh, which ultimately now uh, is going against the geopolitical political interests of the, of the Atlantic Alliance and the United States of America. And of course, the, the, the United States has been threatening China. It has militarized the strategic waterways uh, all the way from, uh, uh, from the East China Sea, South China Sea, uh, the, the, the Arabian Sea, the Gulf of Aden, and the Red See, those are the waterways which are strategic uh, and, uh, and these are di directed ultimately against China. It's not, by, it's not by accident that China now has established a military base in Djibouti, at, right, at the, right at the entrance of the Red Sea. Uh, so there are uh, conflicts between superpowers uh, well, I should, I should uh, qualify. There are confrontations between uh, the United States and its allies and, uh, and now the member states of the Shanghai Cooperation Agreement, uh, which is largely based on an alliance between China and Russia. It's a very powerful alliance. But at the same time, there's been a lot of change in the structures of alliances where several countries have uh, established, have shifted their allegiance, their previous allegiance that they had in relation to the United States and are now trading with China, uh, normalizing relations with Russia and so on. I, 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 I think it's important to point out that now Pakistan uh, is is uh, both Pakistan and India have joined the SCO, and that's a very important development. Why? Because first of all, uh, there's been a rivalry between uh, th those two countries, which was created by the British Empire. Okay, it was created by the British Empire. The the, the two countries, normally the people of those two countries should be friends. And now they are members of the SCO and one of the conditions for their membership is that they resolve territorial differences within the auspices of the SCO as members of the SCO. So that opens up a tremendous opportunity of peace in Southern Asia. I, I don't think we've reached that point, but at the same time, uh, those countries are now trading with Iran, they're trading with China, they're trading with Russia, and they are also, uh, there's also a process of what we might say de-dollarization. We haven't reached that point, but again, uh, shifting political alliances are absolutely crucial uh, in our understanding of what's going on in the world today. Now, let me uh, flash back to, to the other area, main area of, of uh, deployment, which is the Middle East. And, um, and there, of course, the United States is deploying its forces. Uh, invariably, it's deploying its forces through its proxies. It's waging, war on, it's waging war on Syria. It's waging war on, uh, on Yemen. It has waged war on Libya. Uh, and uh, uh, in that regard, uh, the war in Syria is, uh, is now in a phase where uh, the United States proxies, namely the terrorists, the so-called opposition are in retreat. 
um, and, uh, and at the same time, there's been some very important and shifting alliances within NATO, primarily due to uh, the fact that Turkey uh, is no longer Turkey is no longer a, a tr trusted ally. It's a, it's a member of NATO, okay? Turkey is a member of NATO. But as you might say respectfully to President Erdogan, he's sleeping with the enemy, okay? <laughs> he's sleeping with the enemy, why? Because he has, uh, he has an alliance with Donald Trump, but he's also friends with Vladimir Putin, and then he has, has a, an alliance, uh, well, at least it may not be a full-fledged alliance, but there's, there's, a, there's a, an alliance of convenience between Iran and Turkey, um, and, um, and then the question is, can the United States wage a major theater operation involving US, NATO, and Israel uh, when one of its members, which is a heavyweight, it's the second largest uh, power within NATO in terms of conventional forces. But I should also say, Turkey is a nuclear power. Don't forget that. Why? Because it has, it has these tactical nuclear weapons are in fact deployed by five non-nuclear states which are members of NATO and members of the European Union under national command which is Belgium, Holland, Italy, Germany and Turkey. And Turkey has nuclear weapons deployed from its insulic uh, uh, base uh, and um, it has more nuclear weapons than North Korea. In fact, I think it has about five times more. Uh, that's an important concept. Even though those bombs are made in America, they're under national command. And um, the question is, can the United States reasonably go to war uh, with its uh, avowed enemies when one of its key allies, Turkey, is not only um, has not only has alliances and understandings with some of the enemies of the United States of America, but which is also combating, uh, which also has a conflict with the United States in northern Syria, where the United States is supporting the Kurds, and Turkey is is Turkey has the ambition of territorial expansion. Uh, in the border areas of, no of northern Syria. So that, in fact, uh, there is a very, uh, there are many different, uh, you know, there are many different um, contradictions in the structures of these alliances. Uh, Russia has, doesn't have an alliance with Israel, but it has an understanding with Israel it has consultations with, with the Israeli government. Uh, Putin and Netanyahu are meeting on a frequent basis. And of course, that's extremely strategic on the part of the Russian Federation to undertake those, those, uh, those informal alliances because ultimately it also weakens the broader US-dominated alliances. Now, uh, Israel may consult with Russia before obeying the orders of the United States. And Israel is part of the broader alliance of the U.S., NATO, and, and well, U.S., NATO, Israel. Israel signed, has signed a protocol with NATO dating back at least to the, to the, to the early 21st century and has, as part of the same uh, defense system. But on the other hand, Turkey now wants to get the S-400 um, Russian uh, air defense system, which puts it totally uh, in, in, in conflict 
uh, with, uh, with the rest of NATO and uh, signifies possibly that Turkey might at one point decide to exit from, from the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. So we are, in a very, we are at a very dangerous crossroads, but at the same time, um, uh, at the same time, uh, there are developments in the, in the global economy and the global strategic environment which um, contribute to taming the, the hegemonic objectives of the United States I should mention the United States is also uh, creating divisions in the European Union. There's a lot of popular opposition to their role. The governments are conforming. Some of those governments are proxy governments, like France, it's certainly France. Uh, Emmanuel Macron, but his predecessor, uh, Nicolas Sarkozy, uh, well, was really the first not to mention Francois Hollande, this is a new generation of leaders which are pro-American. So that, that you, uh, the European project is, is in limbo. Many European countries now are the victims of these deadly macroeconomic reforms which previously were reserved to third world countries. And uh, I think uh, to conclude, they've asked me to conclude, I think we must uh, understand, first of all, the dangers. Uh, it's very diff it's, it's almost impossible to, to say what would happen in the case of a nuclear war until it actually happens. But I think scientific opinion is, is absolutely uh, in, has a consensus that this would possibly lead uh, to the end of humanity. Uh, if nuclear weapons are used on a more extensive basis, even if we're talking with the more usable. But we, we must beware of the fact that the decision makers behind this military agenda, first of all, they're not always very educated people, okay? I don't think that Trump has the notion of geography. Because if he had the notion of geography, he would understand that the capital of Seoul is about 22 kilometers from the border with North Korea, and it's like going from, from the Trump Tower uh, in Manhattan to New Jersey, okay? So now if you bomb Manhattan, obviously New Jersey will be affected as well, or vice versa. Uh, the, the use of a bloody nose, tactical nuclear operation directed against North Korea which is still on the auction which is still on the on the on the board of the Pentagon would inevitably lead to escalation so we we must address that and this is one of the major main causes of world history our mistakes mistakes we saw what happened with World War one and World War one was also launched uh, as a result of, of shifts in political alliances, okay? Those alliances, the, the triple entente, uh, um, uh, the, tr the triple alliance, the triple entente, shifting alliances, then led to World War I. Our structure of alliances are exceedingly more complex than those which characterized the, fir the First World War. And the, there are a whole series of cross-cutting coalitions which are, constitute elements of stability. Now the United States will, will persist in breaking the alliances which go against its, its, uh, its hegemonic interests. Uh, um, and we can expect that in the future. But we should bear in mind, and that's where counter-propaganda comes into play, and if we're against war, we have to essentially address the fact that the media, uh, as well as uh, as well as uh, governments, uh, are misleading us. Uh, they're telling us that nuclear war is harmless to civilians. It's a lie. Uh, they're telling us that they're waging a war on terrorism. It's a lie. 
They're telling us that they have a responsibility to protect and then they go in and kill people. Again, it's a lie. And, the, and unfortunately, the corporate media uh, is putting pressure on its journalists to, uh, to actually adopt that discourse. And we should understand that mistakes are the main cause of historical change. And uh, there are several types of mistakes. There can be a mistake at the technical level, uh, and uh, nuclear weapons are not safe in that regard. Some of the people who, uh, who are responsible for guarding the nuclear weapons are either on alcohol or drugs. It's documented. LSD, whatever. Alcohol. They are not reliable and if Trump presses the button, we don't know what, or he doesn't press the button, we don't know what will happen. But mind you, uh, under present um, procedures, the button can be pressed by a three-star general because the tactical nuclear weapons have been redefined as conventional weapons. That goes back to 2003. So that mistakes of a technical level are one, but mistakes which result from misunderstanding of the consequences of particular weapon systems and the actions that a decision maker might take, that of course is a political mistake, but it is also due to the fact that the decision makers are the victims of their own propaganda. They believe that they're going after the terrorists. Ask any senator. They believe that nuclear weapons are usable uh, and are safe for civilians. And they ultimately, well, they believe in their lies. And if we go back to Hiroshima, and that's where all this propaganda apparatus started, and it's not finished, and I will uh, conclude on those notes. Uh, Harry Truman uh, addressed the nation on August 9th, 1945, and he stated, the world will note the first atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, a military base. And that was because we wanted to save the lives of innocent civilians. That was his statement, and the news of media applauded, and the fact that Hiroshima was not a military base has been forgotten in the meantime. Uh, those deaths were categorized as collateral damage, and they're still, uh, they are still uh, categorized as collateral damage. And, and of course, in the case of a nuclear war, the collateral damage would extend to the entire population of planet Earth. I have no doubt about that. I'm not making any predictions or anything, but, because, but I think we have to recognize it. I think it is recognized at many levels of society, uh, and we must do our utmost to criminalize war. And, uh, and the notion of criminalizing war was first was formulated in 2005 by Tun Mahathir in the historic um, initiative uh, which is called the Kuala Lumpur Declaration to Criminalize War. Thank you very much.